Unfortunately, here we go again. And Democratic Senator Raphael Warnock of Georgia spoke on the Senate floor yesterday following the shooting in his home state. I think that the unspoken assumption is that this can't happen to me. This won't happen to me. It won't happen to people that I love. But with a mass shooting every day, The truth is, the chances are great. I shudder to say it, but, but the, the truth is, in a real sense, is only a matter of time that this kind of tragedy comes knocking on your door. As a pastor, I'm, I'm praying for those who are affected by this tragedy, but I hasten to say that thoughts and prayers are not enough. And in fact, in fact, it is a contradiction to say that you are thinking and praying and then do nothing. It, it, it is to make a mockery of prayer. Senator Warnock will be our guest later this morning. And Joe, to his point, I mean, this is this is the game Republicans are playing with guns and not addressing the issue. Perhaps at a time like this, they would say you shouldn't talk politics at a time that there was a shooting. You hear it again and again and again. But similar abortion, health care for women, where you have women sitting in hospitals or actually sitting at home waiting for uh fetuses, babies that they are trying to have that might end up killing them because they have abnormalities and they won't make it. And this is happening to real people across America, and it will happen to a Republican come to a home near you at some point, whether it's a shooting or a massive health care crisis where a woman cannot save her own life well, it because has. of what they have done. Well, I mean, I mean, it has. As far as the shootings go, most of the shootings are in red states. I mean, most of the shootings are, 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 are where there are the most guns. There are the most guns in red states. You look at the numbers. Sam, again, I, I just for people that have just started following news in the past few years and they think it's normal yeah. for there to be a shooting in Texas yesterday, a mass shooting in Texas, a mass shooting uh, in Georgia yesterday, a mass shooting in Texas a couple of days ago. When that, you know, uh, cheerleaders getting shot to death uh, when they go into the wrong cars. Um, uh, college students getting shot in the back when they go into the wrong driveways. Uh, young men being shot uh, at, at doors when they're going to pick up their twin uh, uh, brothers. <clears throat> it hasn't always been this way. In fact, since Sandy Hook, the number of people who have died from guns is doubled. Right. This is a choice. Yeah. This is a choice that Republicans, along with gun manufacturers, along with gun lobbyists, have made. And every time there is a slaughter, they cynically say they're coming to get your guns, buy more guns. And so guns just are completely flooded our culture. And people are getting shot. And by the way, I said it a couple of days ago, if we just reported on road rage incidences where somebody got cut off on an interstate on 95 and somebody else started shooting, we'd be talking for hours a day about that. Yeah. It's a gun <laughs> culture and it's a problem unique to the United States in these numbers. It's, it's incredibly true what's striking is the reasons for the shooting i mean we've always had guns mm -hmm. obviously we have more guns but now it's just minor provocations that are leading to mass shootings yes the wrong doorbell yeah the wrong driveway i mean what it's we are resolving the fights right, that, was, that was that was the my god to, to, ask to, a a neighbor, about a to ask a neighbor to just chill out a little bit with the firing of the don't AR shoot your ar-15 in your front yard so please, clearly please. clearly Clearly, it's both a, a, an issue of the number of guns and our collective decision that we can resolve our disputes with guns. I would just say, um, you know, the senator obviously is dealing with a, a huge tragedy today, but I, I quibble with one thing he said. He said, the conventional wisdom is this can't happen to me. I actually think that's no longer the case. I know plenty of associates and friends and family members right. who no longer can go to a mass, event, a, a mass attended event, a concert, even a supermarket 
without having panic attack about what would happen if a shooter walked through the door, looking to find where the exit would be, if need be, that you have to run. And so I don't think we are at the point where we're saying this can't happen to me. I think collectively we're getting to the point where we say, how do we flee if this does happen? I, I, right. I completely agree. I mean, who walks into a mass event without thinking about that? Yeah. An I open air, time. let's say art show or mm. or, uh, or a, a sporting event where they're, they're not screened or a grocery store or anything because you're seeing it, Jackie. It's like stress that you all, take, all so. the time, right. And, and, and Jackie, again, parents, parents who now are afraid to send their kids to school for good reason because they're hearing about active duty i mean active active uh, uh shooter drills that their six-year-old children are having to take yeah, in I mean, first grade it's insanity there's a reason why upwards of 80 percent of americans are in favor of universal background checks despite the republican blockade against passing anything further than the package that was recently passed, which I guess was enhanced background checks for uh, people under the age of 21. But these two issues, I hate to be the person to jump immediately to the political ramifications of these policies or lack thereof, but uh, Republicans are already warning that these two issues, abortion yep. and gun control, are going to be the death knell for Republicans going into 2024 if they can't become a bit more centrist and moderate. I'm, I'm currently working on a profile of Nancy Mace, who's been mm. one of the yeah. lone <laughs> Republican voices on this issue, uh, on finding some common ground with Democrats in some way. Uh, you know, she trashed Ron DeSantis's six-week ban on abortions um, that he signed in the dead of the night that has no exceptions for rape, incest, or health of mothers. Uh, she has also said that, Dem that Republicans can't continue to just call for thoughts and prayers. They need to find some ways to work with Democrats to, to do something to stop these spat of shootings and that they're just, this just can't be the norm. And the to inject a little bit of optimism into the conversation, I think the good news is there is an entire generation of young people and maybe That's it's it. not us and shame on us for not dealing with this. And Joe, you and I have talked about this in 50 years, people will look back and say, were you guys insane? You let this become your culture where people just died going to grocery stores and going to school and everything else. There is an entire generation, conservative, progressive, Democrat, Republican, who has lived through this, who has experienced it. Some of them going through shootings, multiple shootings, and they're just not going to stand for it. They're going to do something about it. So I hate to say we may have to wait a little while, but I do believe help is on the way in a generation that has lived through this crazy violence that somehow we accept in our culture. I, I agree in the two issues uh, that Jackie brought up. You, you have guns and abortion. Interestingly <laughs> enough, those are two issues that Republicans used to use against yeah. Democrats yeah. to show they were out of touch with mainstream America. Now it is Republicans is who are out of touch with mainstream America. And you look at any poll. Yep. A Fox News poll last, last you, Thursday. You look Fox at, News poll. 80 plus percent for background checks and everything else. 61 percent for an assault weapons ban. Times have 77 percent. If you're if you're driving, 77 percent of this Fox News poll want a 30 day waiting period. 80 percent want red flag laws. I was so struck yeah. by how screwed up the gun culture is that you had the Tennessee governor trying to move after Ooh. the slaughter, after the slaughter of little children in a Christian school there, apologizing for, for trying to pass something that was like a red flag law. And he said, I'm not going to use red flag law because that's just, that's a provocation. That's just a term people invented to provoke. I said, really? 80%, keep those numbers up, 80% of Americans support red flag laws. And people in these little bubbles that listen to gun lobbyists and listen to the most extreme legislators who listen to gun lobbyists and gun manufacturers and hedge fund managers who make money off of guns that kill people. They try to make red flag laws a bad, bad, bad phrase? No. 80% of Americans want red flag laws. 80% of Americans want health care checks, mental health care checks as requirements for getting guns. 81%, 21, uh, minimum age requirement for purchasing guns. 
81%. This is radical. Want to actually enforce existing gun laws. Republicans don't like that. So they usually defund the agencies that can do that. 87% support background checks and yes gene yep. a majority of yeah. americans yeah. support the banning of military yeah. style weapons what are military style weapons weapons designed yes. for, mm -hmm. war for war to be more efficient killers of the vietnamese than the guns that our troops were taking over to southeast it's, asia i just, just want to refer everyone to this extraordinary journalism that our news side at the washington post did earlier this year about what the the difference is between what a, a round from an ar-15 military weapon does as opposed to a round from a handgun and it's it's the difference between a wound that might be survivable with a handgun and that is not survivable um, because of the, the high velocity of, of of these rounds from these assault rifles. It's it's a different thing. These are killing machines. They're, That's what the uh, only uh, reason. The thing is, Gene, they're kill it. thing is, let's be really clear, as somebody that has guns and knows guns, mm -hmm. they're killing machines to kill multiple human beings at a time. Yeah. yeah. If you want to kill some, not to be too graphic, mm -hmm. if you want to kill somebody that's coming to your house, you talk to any sheriff, you talk to any law enforcement officer, they'll say, get a shotgun, and when they walk through the door, aim at the frame of the door. Can't miss. It is the most efficient defender of a household there is. Not an AR-15. Yeah. AR-15s aren't for defending homes. They're going out for mass slaughters. Supposed to be in the jungles of Vietnam. Yeah. Supposed to be in, in other countries where our troops go to war. Now they're in supermarkets. Now they're in, for, in, in first grade schools. Now uh, they're, they're in America. And this is a choice, Americans, that you're making if you don't say no to this. We will continue it's this crazy. conversation. Uh, coming. Yeah. All right, now to this ProPublica, out with new reporting this morning on Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas. The organization has been leading the investigative reporting into Justice Thomas, having received luxury trips, real estate deals, and gifts from billionaire Harlan Crow over a 20-year period. Their newest report is regarding tuition payments for the grandnephew of Justice Thomas, who he was raising as his son. Joining us now, one of the ProPublica reporters on the story, Justin Elliott. Uh, Justin, thank you very much uh, for joining us. Uh, this reporting is staggering. Uh, how much money are we talking about as it pertains to this tuition that the Republican donor was providing for the Supreme Court justice? Yeah, so we don't have the full amount, but we're talking uh, p potentially in excess of $150,000. Uh, this was at two private boarding schools, one in Virginia and uh, one in Georgia that Justice Thomas sent his grandnephew, uh, who he was raising as a son, to. And uh, can I ask, Justin, I mean, here's just yet another, another example of, of Clarence Thomas uh, getting financial benefits from a, a massive GOP donor. Um, you read the Wall Street Journal editorial page uh, on, on your reporting. You read the National Review, and they are shocked, shocked and stunned and deeply saddened and said that this is just the left-wing media once again going after a public servant, a good conservative public servant. I'm sure you've read their critiques. Uh, could, you, uh, could you fill in some gaps that they uh, may maybe have uh, left intentionally open? Sure. So I'd say a couple of things. One is that, you know, we're reporting on the entire Supreme Court and uh, I'm contractually obliged to say uh, by ProPublica that, you know, if anyone has information about other justices, they should get in touch. But, you know, uh, but, 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 but seriously, I mean, we haven't we just haven't found anything like this relationship between Crow and, and Thomas with any of the other justices at this point. I mean, we're talking about uh, a billionaire political donor who's who's funding you know, multiple aspects of the life of a justice. Uh, this private school tuition, which we, uh, the story we broke today, um, lavish vacations on his yacht and his private jet over 20 years. Uh, Har Harlan Crow is, owns the house where Justice Thomas's mother is living, apparently rent-free. Um, so this is, uh, you know, we actually spoke to the, the former chief ethics lawyer for the uh, George W. Bush White House, Richard Painter, who said that, you know, basically never seen anything like this. And when he was in the government, if, if you had uh, a staffer taking this level of undisclosed gifts, you'd want to get them out of the government.
So, Justin, obviously, Justice Thomas has not reported these tuition payments or anything else in his annual disclosure forms. You just mentioned the Bush White House lawyers, which seemingly rebuts some of the claims this is just a partisan effort here. So has Justice Thomas offered any explanation at all as to why he thought this was proper behavior? So uh, Justice Thomas did not respond to our questions for this latest story. Uh, he, he, he has released one statement in response to our first story about the travel that Harlan Crow has been providing him with, uh, in which he said, you know, look, I'm, I'm close friends with Harlan Crow, and I was advised by my colleagues that I didn't have to disclose this. Uh, they, have not, they have not said, uh, you know, who gave him that advice or exactly what that advice was. And, you know, all of the ethics lawyers we talked to say this disclosure law is quite clear that you just have to disclose gifts like this. So uh, ProPublica reporter Justin Elliott, thank you very much for your reporting and thank you for coming on this morning. And Joe, uh, once again, it's really hard not to see how this Supreme Court justice was not exposed to being uh, to having his objectivity impacted let's just say it kindly um, yeah. by all the gifts over the course of decades by a Republican donor and then you add the fact and again we try and be objective objective ourselves but it's hard not to notice his wife texting Mark Meadows you know and completely involved in certain things that seem to be part of the big lie. Well, we're, and then we're, you wonder, what is going on? <laughs> regardless of those who reflexively defend him, th this has been a horrible two years, two and a half years, for Justice Thomas's legacy. And, yeah. and for Republicans who are, are, are trying to f dismiss this, I can't even begin to imagine what would happen if it were Justice uh, Sotomayor, My if Lord. it was Justice oh. Kagan. Please. If, 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 this, is, this is, again, let's be really clear about this. I, everybody at this table would be shocked and outraged mm -hmm. and be critical if this were a liberal justice, a left-wing justice that was, take, it was we're taking this. But, Sam, it's just, again, the, 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 there are no rules, it, it, it appears. There, there is nothing that people on the Trump right can do uh, that is going to get condemnation from most Republicans. I mean, this is the sort of stuff I can't even, again, I can't even imagine if any federal judge right. mm -hmm. that I practiced under had taken uh, one hundredth of these sort of gifts. Right. I can't imagine they wouldn't be up for impeachment. You're talking about the need to be objective. Yeah. I would argue it would be non-objective if we didn't treat right. this as the clear-cut so standard behavior it is. It doesn't matter whether he was appointed by a Republican president or as a conservative jurist. This is very evidently clear-cut problematic ethics. Uh, and to your point, I thought about this a little bit. If it was uh, associate uh, or one of his clerks who, right. in the course of discovery, found out a big donor had secretly prayed for that clerk's wife's tuition, that clerk would be tossed out of the court right. tomorrow. Yeah. If it was someone in our profession, imagine a reporter who quietly took $150 in benefits from a donor. That person would lose all credibility instantaneously and yeah. never be able to be in this profession. So, yes, we need to objectively assess the situation by noting clearly just how absurd and outlandish it actually is. And, and, Jackie, and it was not disclosed. <laughs> and That's not disclosed. That, not yeah, exactly. disclosed. The, you know, the National Disclosure Form, uh, Justice Thomas expects us to take seriously his reading of the, of the, of the subtlest nuances of our yeah. Constitution and yeah. what every clause means in the mm -hmm. original and everything, you know, very, very carefully parsing that. And he, and he also wants us to believe he can't understand the very simple instructions on a disclosure form. It's, it's ridiculous. And, and the court's doing nothing. Believable. John Roberts, uh, who I've always said was an institutionalist, certainly not acting like an institutionalist now, because somebody that wanted to protect the institution with the Supreme Court's approval ratings at an all-time low would step forward and be far more active than this. This is something you just can't sit back this is really and leave for, leave for vacation this summer this and just a, hope it yeah. goes away. So this if is, you're an institutionalist, David, and let me say again, I want to underline this fact for the Chief Justice. The Supreme Court's credibility <clears throat> with the American people is at an all-time low. So, I, Joe, I, I think you're right that this comes down to the chief justice 
we, we really don't want a situation, Jackie, you cover Congress, where Congress is trying to legislate rules for another branch of government. It, 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 may, it may come to that. But is, isn't this centrally Chief Justice Roberts' responsibility, that he's the person who can say, this reporting isn't, isn't partisan, this reporting is about the basics of accountability that every other judge in America has to deal with, and we, and we do too. And here, and here are the rules that I, as Chief Justice, am going to announce. Yeah, well, interestingly, Judge Michael Luddick and uh, Lawrence Trump who appeared before the Senate Judiciary Committee earlier this week advised Congress that they could not pass a bill forcing the Supreme Court to impose their own set of rules, but under the Constitution they were allowed to actually create a, a bill that outlined a code of conduct and then uh, have that enforced by some independent arbiter. Right. Uh, and that is the Moving bill. forward. Exactly. And that is the bill that uh, Susan, uh, sorry, Lisa Murkowski mm -hmm. and Angus King proposed mm -hmm. last week. Um, there is not any sort of unanimous consent about this bill in any way, but you did have Republicans and Democrats agree yep. that this is problematic. But I will say, you know, judges are still untouchable politically. Even when I'm thinking back to our reporting during the January 6th committee that investigated uh, the attack on the Capitol, <coughs> Liz Cheney privately did not want to touch Clarence Thomas. You know, she was the, she's the most outsp outspoken Republican against a lot of sort of the Democratic backsliding and issues that we've seen with the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. And she had said to her, her privately to staffers and investigators that she didn't want to touch touch Clarence Thomas's wife. She didn't want to continue to, to make that a spotlight, and she thought it was irrelevant to the investigation writ large. Uh, and a lot of her colleagues, Democrats at, uh, at the time, felt like that was because she didn't want to be the Republican responsible for taking down Clarence Thomas. Well, but Clarence yeah. Thomas, though, in fact, uh, didn't he rule in a case that, uh, that uh, it was the lone dissenter? Exactly. That touched exactly on what his wife was involved in. Failed to recuse himself once again. Oh, yeah. The Washington Post, Jackie Alimany, thank you very much. And Admiral, good morning. What has been the advice and counsel from the United States, from the Biden administration, toward President Zelensky and the Ukrainian military about attacking within the borders of Russia? That was one of the reasons we were skeptical when this news broke yesterday, and many others yeah. have been since, which was that Ukraine knows that this would be an escalation if they were to reach that far within Russia. So what has the United States told Ukraine about that? Well, obviously, we don't, uh, you know, we certainly don't dictate to them the terms by which the, they defend themselves or the operations they conduct. However, we've been clear with them publicly and we've been clear privately that we do not encourage nor do we enable them to strike outside Ukraine. Um, well, I had to ask you questions so close, okay, but uh, yeah. to the podium. Okay, um, yeah. two, two questions, <laughs> actually. What, what's the latest that we uh, can assess this claims of an attack on the Kremlin? Obviously, uh, Secretary Blinken said take it with a was a shaker of large salt, shaker of a salt. large shaker of salt. Do we have to increase the size of the shaker? And then uh, secondly is, I'm kind of curious for your thoughts on uh, a statement uh, Speaker McCarthy made when he was overseas in Israel, when he was asked about, mm -hmm. you know, Russia and Ukraine. And, you know, the expectation was in some respects that he would be skeptical of right. uh, the war. But in fact, he turned on the reporter, said Russia should leave Ukraine. Did that give you... I also, oh, talk, I, just, I, I also talked about Russia killing children. Right, yeah. Talked about the war crimes. I, I was going to give general. you a direct Henry question, but I'm sort of curious for your general back. thoughts on what that says about our current political moment. So, on the first question, uh, we still don't really know what happened. Um, so, we're we're not making an assessment right now. I did see comments from uh, Dmitry Peskov this morning, uh, Putin's uh, flack, and claiming that we had something to do with it. Washington, I can assure you that yeah. there was no involvement by the United States in this, whatever it was. It didn't involve us. You're saying we didn't buy a drone from Radio Shack no. and launch right. it like three, uh, yeah, three minutes away? Basically, yeah. Yeah, basically we, don't do we, we, we don't yeah. do Radio We don't do that. Um, and we had nothing to do with this. So Peskov is just lying there, pure, pure and simple. Um, and then on the, uh, Speaker McCarthy, uh, I, look, we, we, uh, we welcome his comments uh, about support for Ukraine. Uh, we certainly agree that Ukraine needs to continue to receive support, as the president has said, for as long as it takes. You just saw us again, another another package uh, here this week. So we're, we're committed to that. We're glad to see that the speaker is too. And frankly, you know, if you look at, there's a small minority, uh, mostly in the House of Republicans, who uh, are becoming vocal about not supporting Ukraine. But they are a small minority. Mo most of the House Republicans are 
still in favor of supporting Ukraine. Certainly the leadership is, and we're grateful for that. I mean, there's been terrific bipartisan and bicameral support here, uh, and that's a good thing. And again, I think Speaker McCarthy's comments spoke to that. And I agree with Joe. It was heartwarming to also see him push back uh, on, the, on the Russian state reporter. I mean, he wasn't taking any guff from these guys or propaganda uh, organs, nothing more. Um, and it was, good to, it was good to hear him say that. Boy, it was. I mean, Speaker McCarthy sent such a strong message to people who think that you can divide Americans over Ukraine. Nordstrom is now the latest business to join a retail exodus from downtown San Francisco. The company cited dwindling foot traffic in the decision not to renew leases for two of its stores, including the one in the Westfield Mall, which placed blame for the departure partly on unsafe conditions for customers and employees and urged city leaders to find a solution to combat, quote, rampant criminal activity. Safety concerns were also cited for Whole Foods after the company announced last month it was shutting down flagship stores in the area. Retailers Anthropology and Office Depot are also leaving. But San Francisco officials argue the city's struggles to retain businesses has less to do with an increase in crime, but rather a problem with public perception. Yeah, crime will do that. With us now, NBC <laughs> News correspondent Jake Ward. So, Jake, here, here's what I don't get. Yeah. Okay, here we go. I love San Francisco. Yeah. I've always loved going so to San Francisco. Uh-huh. I know where you're going. Go ahead. Absolutely going. Yep. have loved it. And so I take it personally. Mm. When I go back to San Francisco, and it has become so much more dangerous, and then I get lectured by people saying, oh, San Francisco, this is how San Francisco's always been. This is just a right-wing attack on San mm. Francisco. And it's almost that argument, what are you going to do? Are you going to believe me or your lying eyes? And all of my friends that have gone there, people who can, I consider San Francisco a magical city. It is. That's it's right. a dangerous magical city now. And I just want to know, where do these statistics come from that people use and say, oh, it's as safe as it's ever been? These are just right wing talking points. So I think that the complication here that we're all looking at is, you know, first of all, let's just point out, right, San Francisco, for a city of less than a million people, has a pretty outsized national reputation, it's getting a lot of attention for this. And recently, the death of Cash App founder Bob Lee in this horrific staffing, mur stabbing murder downtown, um, you know, it has drawn, again, incredible uh, reputational harm to that city. But in our look at the statistics, what we learned is that, in fact, the death of Bob Lee says a lot more about our assumptions as a nation about crime than it does about the crime itself. After Bob Lee's death in San Francisco, many commentators speculated on social media that the killer was someone homeless and mentally ill. David Sachs, a Silicon Valley investor, said so on his podcast. This idea of just releasing these people onto the street I just think is an outrageous abdication of responsibility. But the man arrested in the crime turned out to be a tech consultant who knew the victim, according to police. And just like the mistaken assumptions in that case, San Francisco's dangerous reputation does not square with the data. San Francisco has challenges with crime, with public safety, and we're doing everything we can to deal with it. But just because people are seeing it in a more heightened way because of social media videos and sadly, sometimes people jumping to conclusions, it's unfortunately made San Francisco a bit of a target. Violent crime in San Francisco is at historic lows, and its murder rate is far below most other cities its size, according to police and FBI data. But the pandemic brought a wave of property crime. The bike connection saw its windows smashed repeatedly. Have you had much in the way of property damage since then? Thankfully, no. Just kind of vandalism type things, but we haven't had any major attempts to have our bikes stolen. No big break-ins. No big break-ins. What about drug activity on the streets? What do you see about that? That does seem to be worse. It seems like fentanyl has really gotten to a lot more kids. And that is where San Francisco really suffers. A fentanyl epidemic here, more than 200 overdose deaths in just the first three months of the year, has the governor calling in the Highway Patrol and the National Guard to help. The district attorney, Brooke Jenkins, criticized her predecessor's progressive reforms and ran for office on a platform of greater accountability. Prosecutions and convictions are up. I've taken a very strong approach in sending a message that this is not going to be something that we tolerate or take lightly because of the fact that we have so many overdose deaths.
And should we be in any way uh, doubtful that that's going to make a difference, considering that we're not seeing fundamental numbers like overdose deaths go down? That those problems seem to be just as bad as they've ever been. It's a twofold situation. We have to have public health resources available to those who are struggling with addiction, while at the same time law enforcement does its job to make sure that those who are peddling fentanyl are taken off the street or at the very least are held accountable. But while San Franciscans are as safe from violent crime as they were in the 1960s, Jenkins says perception as well as data shapes her priorities, like aggressively prosecuting drug dealers. Our metric is what the people of San Francisco feel, what the people who come into San Francisco to work and to visit feel. And irrespective of what the data shows, we have a job to do to make sure that we address that feeling. But the city's public defender says that perception distracts from long-term policies that can actually change the city's drug problem. Housing, job opportunities, people get more stable and people get more stable, we're less likely to have these kind of overdose deaths. And more prosecution does not, in your view, solve that problem? Not at all. We know that from 50 years of experience. So what we've really learned here is that San Francisco absolutely deserves its national reputation around crime when it comes to property crime, and especially when it comes to the big problem, which is overdose deaths and drug crime. But violent crime is as low as it has almost ever been, and it is that discrepancy. What you see on the street, the grittiness, the horror that you see walking around, that is real, but it turns out not to correlate with an actual chance of being a victim of you violent know, I crime. I lived in San Francisco long, long ago, yeah. right, in the late 70s, the golden age, right? Yes. And, and and I'll tell you, you didn't walk around the Tenderloin District, mm. you know, late at night um, very comfortably. There were, there were, in fact, parts of uh, the city south of Market Street uh, that were really kind of seedy yeah. and, um, <laughs> uh, and, and compared, certainly compared to what they are now. Now there's like art galleries and museums and all the stuff where uh, it wasn't very nice back then. Well, and, and, and I'm not sure how you would have also recorded it all and shared it with the world in Right. the 1970s. Right? Yeah, exa exactly. That, exactly. And and so, I, you know, what we didn't have then was this huge, visible, homeless um, encampment, basically, with, with, with tents and everything like that, even though there was a homelessness problem even then. Um, and, and I'm wondering also, uh, just in terms of downtown, um, the business district probably has sort of emptied out like business districts everywhere because of the pandemic That's and right. those were so isn't that why a lot of and these online. retailers are closing down and restaurants <laughs> well, I mean, so wait 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 what's the laws that they have though that you don't get arrested with that unless you reach a certain level for for property crimes i mean yeah. come on i mean I, again with, with all due respect we're friends mm -hmm. or at least we're friends on tv <laughs> oh, there are people who love san francisco that want right. to go to san francisco and they don't go into san francisco going i'm going to come in here to hate this and take a picture and post it on Instagram. I, well, when, I, when people talk about their feelings, there's a reason why people who go to San Francisco, who love San Francisco, have negative feelings. Uh, so, so I, have, I have colleagues correct. and exactly associates correct. who've lived in San Francisco who have left in the past years precisely because of those feelings and perceptions and realities. Realities. They don't, yeah. they don't I mean, look, the statistics are nuanced, obviously, but clearly people within the city limits also feel like the city's changed. For but, the and, and, Whole Foods. Whole right. Foods. I mean, you talk with them. Nordstrom's. Yep. I mean, we have we have good friend who went in went into a store about five minutes later. You know, people come in with guns. They see. You know, they see everybody gets on the floor. This is like in a in a supposedly good part of town. There. So again. It's not just, quote, feelings. This isn't a Morris Albert song. It's a 1970s throwback. This is like people are in San Francisco and they don't feel right. safe. So Maybe they're not going to yeah. get shot in the head. Let me, let me just stack up a few okay. factors here that I think everybody in this country should be thinking about when it comes to their own downtowns and what's going on. So here are the things that we have now that we did not have in the 1970s and that everybody is going to have to deal with at some point. The first one is opioids, right? We've got a fentanyl epidemic that is making people uh, fall out of their lives in this fundamental way, and we have no answer to that in this country at all. Second, we have the pandemic, which not only right. cratered downtown businesses in all ways, right. 
Right. It also, in San Francisco, especially where 85% of the tax revenue comes from the downtown financial district, you have a place in which people are lit literally that industry invented the demise of the downtown quarter because mm -hmm. everybody can work from home. Those companies yeah. absolutely blew up their own leases right. by being the companies that Salesforce made them. Salesforce moved out of the Salesforce, Salesforce Tower. Whose number is right? <laughs> the biggest, whose the name tallest is company everywhere. Whose name right. is everywhere has moved out of there, right? <laughs> then on top of that, you have a tremendous lack of investment in resources. There is no inpatient mental health facility inside the city yeah. limits of San Francisco. The wow. closest one you've got is in Napa. That's an yeah. hour away. Wow. So you've got people Crazy. who've got a core, you know, people wow. who have serious mental illness and no resources at all. There's a movement right now in California to try to uh, coerce people into treatment if they can get it. The, the, I was talking to public officials and they told me privately they call that the court to nowhere because there is no services to help these people out. So you've got all those factors. And on top of that, Joe, I do not disagree with you. When you walk the streets, it feels bad. You feel unsafe. But all of us, I would say, local people who, when we heard about the death of Bob Lee, and of course this is just a feeling, but again, feelings count as we're discussing here. I remember hearing about his death and thinking, what? He what? He was killed where? By right. who? Yeah. It right. is so unusual in the experience of people who live in the Bay Area to think that someone would randomly do that. And then it turned out, of course, it's a person he knew. It was, a, at least that's the alleged, uh, you know, right. that's, that's the person who was arrested here. And so there is absolutely a crisis in San Francisco. And that crisis wow. is homelessness and fentanyl. The crisis is not dangerous. I'm